Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think we're going to ex. Investment is the key to a stable global economic landscape. It helps strengthen Egypt's position in the world, the region, and in the hearts and minds of its citizens. Investors are the spark that help create new opportunities, engaging individuals to unify and have meaningful dialogue. Dialogue that allows imaginations and ideas to blossom. Innovation that flourishes. Entrepreneurial investments pave the path to modern infrastructure, creating meaningful opportunities and transforming the investment climate. Creating new jobs and building strong industries, investment changes lives. It builds a prosperous Egypt. The time is now. Invest in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the United Kingdom, international broadcaster Nick Gowing. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are trying to leave or how many are just taking a rest break, but uh, this is about your business and it's about your opportunities. Uh, so I hope you will stay uh, rather than congesting the coffee area. Uh, this is about uh, relaxing the atmosphere a little bit. Um, and I'd like you to feel that as we discuss uh, enhancing the investment climate in Egypt, you too can actually uh, offer your thoughts from the floor rather than being passive uh, as you've been for the last 24 hours. Um, engage a little bit in conversation, but using, if you can, your tablet or your smartphone. And there is an address which uh, is all over the place, but I'll tell it to you now. Ask at Egypt the future. Dot com. You want to know what the opportunities are and the chances are that your investment is going to be in good hands. And I'd like to invite uh, Ashraf Salman, the Minister for Investment for Egypt, to come and join me here on the platform. Uh, I'm told that the minister is actually with the president at the moment. So what I'm going to do is invite the rest of the panel onto the platform because that may take a few minutes. We're running a little late. So let me invite uh, those who are standing in the wings to come and join me after we've just listened to Joe Kaiser. Uh, because uh, if you remember what the prime minister said right at the beginning, he said, uh, we are confident investors will be impressed. We therefore need to know how impressed they are by what is happening. Uh, remember uh, what the finance minister told us this morning. We're offering you a brilliant package. Um, I would encourage you uh, as we are joined. You, the president, you as the. Can I ask you if you would, uh, again, remember that address, please, uh, which is ask at egyptthefuture.com. The minister has now arrived, so I'm going to talk to him for about seven minutes, and then we're going to be joined by seven other investors, both from within Egypt and also elsewhere in the world. And I'd like you to remember also that after this, I'm going to be interviewing the former prime minister of the United Kingdom, Tony Blair who is very much involved through his Africa Governance Initiative. And therefore, use your smartphone or tablet and that address if you have any points you would like me to put to Mr. Blair. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much indeed. We have about seven minutes. Uh, you, of course, were in investment banking for 16 years. Yes. What's it like 
having been on the outside, now you're inside. What have you discovered of the culture of government? I discovered being outside is much better. <laughs> Why is that? Why is that? Uh, we're, we're actually having a very rough ride inside. It is really... Uh, what as kind we of have, rough ride? As, as, as we have uh, listened to the session of the Prime Minister, we have a lot of things that I'll quote him, we have to use dynamite in, in, in uh, building new system and in uh, having some sort of uh, re-engineering white paper approach process. But I've, got to, I've got to press you, Mr. Salma. I mean, using dynamite, you tend to destroy everything. Yes. You don't want to destroy what no, is inside, the system, whether the, the fabric or the people. Uh, here I come to uh, re-engineering process where I mean the system. The bureaucratic system needs to, to be totally destroyed. We need to build a new system. We have to get rid of uh, the existing bureaucratic system. And this is a major change between, or major difference between inside and outside. How much will that hinder, how much will it handicap your ability to deliver at the kind of speed we've been hearing from the president, the prime minister, and from other ministers already? Uh, uh, actually, it is, it is definitely a significant percentage of obstacles that needs to be removed in order to achieve uh, and deliver um, the figures that we have uh, heard in the morning, even from Ministry of Finance, achieving 7% growth inclusive uh, on GDP and achieving a poverty rate uh, uh, below the 20% and also achieving an unemployment rate of below 10%, reaching... Uh, uh, a total debt uh, to GDP of around 80 to 85 percent and managing the comfort zone of inflation to Central Bank of Egypt from 6 to 8 percent. These are achievable figures, definitely, but it needs very hard work, it needs a uh, big focus, and it needs discipline and commitment. Commitment to open market economy, commitment uh, uh, to uh, bring back stability, and commitment to bring back prosperity to Egyptian people. But you're coming in from outside as a former investment banker where you essentially could rule the roost where you were working. What are you discovering about the ability <coughs> or the resistance from inside, mindset, behavior, which actually make the scale of transformation and the speed really an enormous challenge? It is an enormous challenge, but it is very much achievable for basic uh, principle. Are you changing minds in uh, uh, We have, we have uh, cabinet members where whom all have a mentality of private sector mind. And we have very good harmony working together. And it is a real teamwork for, for a change. But what it about the public servants, teamwork. though? The public servants in your ministry who uh, have to deliver what you as an outsider are asking of them. We're trying to step in individually till we really build an institutional framework. So here comes the private sector partnership. We do use private sector a lot in, in, uh, to replace capacity building into the government. For example, if we, if we will look into the, uh, the organization of the conference, we're not offering our projects ourselves because we do not have capacity building to deliver uh, a standard uh, 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 project and standard feasibility studies that is expected uh, uh, to be uh, uh, delivered by investors. So we have used uh, investment banks in a partnership process in order to package all the projects and offer it uh, to investors uh, during the conference. But what I'm getting at, Minister, is the fact that, and it's not unique to Egypt, the speed at which change has to take place can often be handicapped by the system you inherit, and the system tends to try and drag anchor chains behind it. It tries to slow things down, because that's what systems tend to do, whereas you are trying to be speedy at the kind of ex speed of expectation that the investors have. How do you resolve that really very personal human problem? I, I think it is, it is in the process of uh, uh, resolution, because uh, we have seen a lot of uh, transactions that is taking place uh, into the last, uh, uh, I would say, eight months. And we have seen also the process of uh, speeding up all the mega projects 
These are all done not only by ministers and not only by decision makers, but is already done by uh, people underneath. So it is, I think that the, the direction of the president and the direction of the existing government is really disseminated uh, uh, to most of the levels of uh, uh, employees in the government. You're going to be sitting there uh, and joined by a number of investors in a moment. What kind of feedback are you getting from them? How much are you able to respond to their very real concerns and fears that really, even if the aspiration is good, it's still not fast enough? The matter is not aspiration, in my own opinion. The matter is restoring confidence. So, and this is a word we've been uh, listening to during all our trips, our latest trips in China, in US, in UK, in United Arab Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, and in Kuwait for the past two months. We've been uh, uh, going everywhere in order uh, to solve investors' problems and in order to explain the economic reform program of Egypt. So uh, the, the major highlight here is restoring investor confidence. But what are they saying? Are they worried? What are they worried? I, I think we're, we're very much close to achieving that confidence again. Close to achieving confidence, but what are they putting on your agenda of what still has to be done? Uh, definitely the package of legislation that has to do with uh, creating investment climate, and we're working on that very fast, and also uh, uh, historical problems that is already still into uh, the economy, and we're also working on that uh, through different mechanisms. Uh, the Dispute Resolution Committee that is uh, headed by the Minister of Justice, and also Resolution Committee that is headed by the Prime Minister. So we're pushing very much in order to speed up the process of problem solving. All right, Minister, thank you. Stay there, because we're now going to open it up to uh, seven investors, and you can see there are eight chairs with the Minister. That's eight people. So I'm going to be going down there, um, not least because uh, that's where I hope several of you might have at least uh, posted some thoughts about what you want to put on the agenda, which I can put to both the Minister uh, and also the other investors. And can I remind those of you who maybe weren't in the room when I said it, that I'll be joined by Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister, who's working throughout Africa uh, to discuss the issues of reform in Egypt uh, and Africa, that in about uh, 30 minutes. So let me uh, invite on uh, our other guests. First of all, Karim Awad, uh, who's CEO of uh, EFG Hermes. I hope he's going to join me. There we are, good, welcome. C keep coming in. And Hazim Badran, who's uh, Deputy CEO of CIA Capital in Egypt, who used to work at Hermes. Uh, then we have uh, Alan Bajani, CEO of uh, Majid Al Fatayim Holdings in the UAE. Enormous, enormous uh, investment in retail sector, both in Egypt and right around the region. Uh, then we also have uh, Ashram Salman. Uh, who is the minister, for those of you who haven't uh, seen him before, Ahmed Boza, who is president of Coca-Cola International from the US. Lub Lubna Olayan, uh, who uh, is from Saudi Arabia, uh, who is CEO of Olayan Financing Company in Saudi Arabia. And I'm sure, <laughs> reflecting what Christine Lagarde said at, her, at the beginning of her presentation yesterday, it's delightful to have a woman on the panel. Welcome. And finally, uh, we have uh, Nagib Suelis, known to so many of you here as Chairman of Weather Investments and Executive Chairman of Rascom. Now, I'm told that Joe Kaiser isn't joining us, uh, having given his remarks to John Defterios, but I'm going to come down here hoping. Ah, oh, you are here, Joe. Come. I was told you weren't here. Well, you know Joe, uh, and he's uh, been telling you about the investments he's made in Egypt and why. Uh, so let me come down here, mainly in the hope that some of you will have sent messages which I can put to the panel. But Nagib, can I come to you first of all? Because um, you were described in the Financial Times a couple of days ago in uh, these terms, uh, Egyptian, uh, an Egyptian tycoon with a sharp political edge. And I think you also want to underline to me what your description is of you on Twitter. It's absolutely correct. <laughs> which is? Uh, Egyptian investor with a political sharp edge. That's what you said. And what about Twitter? What's your Twitter say? Uh, ah, on Twitter? Oh, 
Okay, uh, it says uh, freedom fighter, tired but strong. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, Nagib, I'm coming to you first because I want to know what are the obstacles? We've heard so many positives this morning of the way things are going to go, but you're making big investments in the sugar factory in the south of the country, uh, in public transportation, thinking of licenses for the river as well. What, is, what, are, what still needs to be done from what we've heard this morning? I mean, the devil is always in the details. I mean, all these, uh, we have the, the will, the wish, and the means to uh, invest. Uh, we, we feel that this is, uh, uh, this is our country. We need to set the example that Egyptian investors are investing in their country to give uh, comfort to our foreign investors. Uh, a lot of these licenses and the details of this licensing uh, is not ready yet. You know, so there needs to, the, uh, unfortunately, the, the structures under the ministers are not working as fast and as efficient as our current ministers. I mean, we're lucky we have these uh, good performing ministers right now, but some of them were stuck with old baggage from the past where they should have fired all the people under them and got new ones. Well, <laughs> the minister used the term dynamite. And, is dynamite and what you really want for a ministry? Exactly, he's, that, that he's absolutely everything. right, but he has to start with his own ministry first, sorry. First dynamite. <laughs> but, uh, but Nagib, as you've said that, what is the advice you would give to a former investment banker now inside government about what needs to be done to create that impression of uh, constant positive movement? He needs to, they, we need to change the teams because all the teams in the bureaucracy have grown up and became uh, so uh, uninnovative, bureaucratic, slow, inefficient that if you try to work with them, nothing is going to get done. I can give you an example. Like the Minister of Electricity, he put the feeding uh, price for uh, solar energy, something we are interested in, in September. And today we don't still have a bankable PPA agreement on which we can put our money and we're ready. We're ready to do more than that. So because maybe some of the stuff there are not up to the same challenge. You know, our president is so in a hurry. Our prime minister is, is in a hurry. Uh, Ashraf doesn't even get any sleep, you know. So where's the problem? So the problem, my advice again, change your teams, bring young people, well-educated, change the laws. Oh, there's one important point here, and I'll finish, is that we need a law that protects the civil servants when they take wrong decisions. We need a law because the problem is post-25 January, we threw a lot of innocent people in the jail just because they took some decisions, even they were not even wrong. We threw them in jail. So you want to tell a civil servant, sign, his best bet is not to sign because nobody will tell him you didn't sign, you're delaying, you know, but if he signs and it was a wrong decision, as long as he was not bribed, as long as he did not benefit himself from the decision, he should not be punished. And if he's inefficient, he should be getting a decrease in his salary. But this law is important so we can move on. Well, let me go to the minister, if I may, quickly. <laughs> minister, let, that's an important challenge for you as a new minister, a new member of a political system, as opposed to being outside. How practical is that? And I've got a couple of other questions which have come in. Let me say in an optimistic manner, I don't see problems. We have seen during the last two days, yesterday and today, people talking like Nagib, and we have seen ministers presenting the, uh, uh, the main reform program for, uh, for Egypt in the coming five years. And we do understand that we have a bureaucratic system, but we will not let this bureaucratic system to control uh, our country, and we will not let this bureaucratic system to stay obstacle uh, 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 towards our growth strategy and towards bringing back our country and bringing prosperity to people and to the, our country. So we will not let it. Maybe this law is important. However, on the other side, it goes back to uh, uh, also uh, not only be, uh, you, you're, since September you have feed and tariff and it is not implemented, not only like that, it is we have a very silent revolution when economic uh, uh, reform is concerned. It is silent revolution because we're changing a lot of laws in the same time. We're changing culture in the same time. We are moving very fast in mega projects. We are, 
what okay. all what we are doing is seven months right it is seven months so we have to be more realistic this economy started to turn around in only seven months in only seven months we started to see 5.5 percent growth in gdp first half in only seven months we started to see deregulation liberalization of power plant sector electricity sector in only seven months we started to see commitment to investors commitment to problem solving we are making revolution right. okay <laughs> Nagib, as you represent as given what you just said earlier are you comfortable he is saying it's only seven months essentially understand we're being realistic that we're making enormous progress well, it's not an excuse it's only seven months i mean what's it <laughs> i mean <laughs> it's uh, we could have done this uh, uh, you know in our private because we come from the private sector you know and our seven their seven months in our private sector is one day so it's not uh, i mean we can do we can do that this what i said now are things if they're not done then nothing will happen i mean i'm telling you i live in this country i worked since i was a child the biggest obstacle in this country is that the civil servant if he doesn't do anything he doesn't get punished if he delays you he doesn't get punished if he does something right, he doesn't get credit. If he does something wrong, he goes to prison. Mm -hmm. So wh who's going to sign anything? We, we understand that there's still a difference there on that issue. But from the minister, we've heard one position. From Nagib, we've heard another. Now, Lubna, you wanted to come in uh, as an outsider. But there are already a number of questions here which are important about, about what this new government is going to do to encourage women to invest, specifically women. Lubna, your view from Saudi Arabia. Well, uh, my view from Saudi Arabia, I'm not, I'm, I am a woman, but I'm going to speak on behalf of the business sector of Saudi Arabia. We have been an investor in Egypt as a group for more than 30 years, direct investments as well as investing in the financial markets. What we heard is amazing and great news, but we all know that transformation is, is much more difficult than starting fresh. So I think the question, and for all of us business people looking at it, is changing the mindset, and which is Najib's point. It is, I mean, we heard great things, but how quickly are, are they going to be implemented? I know in our businesses here, getting licenses to operate is a nightmare. The bureaucracy is very, very difficult. In all sectors, we're involved in real estate, we're involved in fast food, and even I'm involved with, with a charity, with an NGO. Licenses are very, very difficult to get. What we heard is a great encouragement, and we are all for it, but I think there has to be uh, effective and, and moving much forward, and I, and I totally agree, seven months is a long period. So changing the mindset of all the bureaucracy of Egypt is the challenge. All right. Well, let's get, let's get a few more views. Karim Abouad, uh, what's your view from uh, inside the country as CEO of EFG Hermes? No, I think uh, the, definitely the point uh, raised by Mr. Sawiris and the point raised by Ms. Alayan are things that are a concern for a number of investors. We've seen a shift uh, over the past uh, couple of years in the way that investors from not just from the, uh, the Arab world or globally are looking at Egypt, but most importantly, I think, the way Egyptian investors are looking at Egypt. Because at the end of the day, if you are a GCC or, or a Western investor and you're looking to invest in the country and you see that the investments are not coming in from Egypt, uh, from the Egyptians first, I think this is, uh, this is always an issue. Capital expenditure figures have been on the rise. Um, aggregate uh, debt figures have also been on the rise for the past uh, uh, year, year and a half for now. But definitely there are issues. The government is working hard on tackling those issues. And again, the, the demographics of the country continue to be quite attractive for a number of investors across the board and across a number of sectors. Picking up Nagib's point, do you want them to move faster? You're saying that essentially it's got to be faster or not? I think the bureaucracy is definitely going to be an issue that needs to be resolved by the government going forward. But mm -hmm. it is easier said, I mean, I sit on the private sector, so it is easier said sometimes than done. Hassan Badran, uh, your position in CI Capital, you used to work for Hermes, of course. Yeah, I just want to point out on a very important point, just to give uh, some justice to I mean, the, 
point on uh, lifting the subsidies and points on uh, uh, finally, although late uh, uh, seeing the slide and the uh, FX on the Egyptian pound, this is the first time, at least in my lifetime, that I see a, a government of Egypt taking such courageous decisions and not thinking about their popularity on the street and rather thinking uh, uh, about the good, way, the, the benefit uh, to the country. So I think this is the point that we need to uh, definitely set out. Um, other than that, I mean, after three years of working a lot to try to uh, get investments into the country, because this is what I do for a living, uh, we're finally uh, seeing uh, a lot of movement, uh, a lot of st uh, things need still to be done. Uh, uh, most importantly, availing uh, uh, foreign currency and just continuing on, you know, the uh, courage that we've seen and, and just to be, uh, uh, trying to uh, ease uh, entry and most, more importantly, exit of investors will, will, will work well for us in the next three years. Let's get, make a judgment about the kind of multiplier effect investments can have. Let me come to you, Alain Bajani, um, particularly because of your, your role in the retail sector, in the hotel sector, I can just read it off, 18 shopping malls, 56 supermarkets, 50, uh, 11 hotels, nine movie theaters with 92 screens, creating 144,000 new jobs. Now, where do you see the potential here? Where do you see the roadblocks at the moment in Egypt? Well, I think that uh, everyone's right. I mean, seven months is seven months. It's, it's true, it takes, it's too long. But seven months in the lifetime of a government that's coming after challenges that we've seen is also, uh, I would say, from a company that is, has been investing in Egypt for the past 15 years and, uh, and has been consistently present in Egypt. Uh, we have seen tremendous, tremendous will and tremendous achievements on certain fronts when it gets to turning our investments into reality. And we have to be fair. Uh, I, I'm not sure it is, maybe the achievements are the same in every sector. Uh, it is true that the culture still needs to change. It is true that this is maybe the major challenge. Changing laws is easier than changing culture. You can legislate as much as you want. If you, but implementing those laws with the right mindset and having what uh, uh, what Mr. Sawiris is talking about in terms of having the, pe the right people at the right places making the right decisions is something that is not so easy to do when you have such a legacy. So I would say everyone is right, but to be fair, what we have been seeing in terms of support from this government is something that has been unseen in the past till today. And that's a reality. <laughs> so we shouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater. Uh, the story of the story of Egypt today is a very bright story. It has a lot of challenges. We look at these challenges with confidence because we, really, we see clearly the potential. Now it's up to us to make it happen and of course the government has to stay the course and double its effort to make it happen in reality. Now when it gets to uh, what you have mentioning about our investment plans and our commitment to grow uh, in Egypt, it's absolutely a result of the type of uh, willpower that we have seen coming from the government in the past seven months. Uh, this is not new for us. We have been here, as I said, for 15 years. It is something that we have been wanting to do, but we haven't been able to do. And trust me, it is not for the lack of trying. Today, we believe that we can do it. Right, uh, I'm getting a lot of questions here. So before I come to you, if, if, if I may, uh, particularly for those of, uh, both of you in investment about the measures being put in place for financing SMEs. What are your perspectives, both of you, uh, about for investment and the, the measures being put in place? Again, are the right measures being put in place? I think there are definitely positive. This is an area where we definitely uh, need to grow. I think, the, you know, overall the main hurdle would be the high interest rates that the country is suffering from because of the uh, obvious political risk and the, uh, the, 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 the phase that we've just uh, passed through. I think if we can subsidize further this sector through availing uh, uh, funding at a, at a lower rate, we'll definitely pay back in social terms uh, as well as uh, economic terms. Uh, Karim. I think it, uh, it's definitely a key driver for the economy going forward. Big businesses are important, but at the end of the day, given the mass scale of, uh, of the Egyptian population, 
I think small and medium enterprises are, are definitely the way to go. And it seems to be that there is a lot of focus from the government on trying to uh, encourage small and medium enterprises, and there is a lot of, uh, uh, of support that comes from the international organizations that, and the international donor organizations that are very interested in building this sector in Egypt going forward. Let me go to Coca-Cola, uh, and uh, I should say that Lubna Olayan, uh, one of her companies in Saudi Arabia, bottles Coca-Cola. Um, but what's your perspective uh, as you're looking uh, at, at Egypt and its relative uh, position compared to other challenges you face in many other markets around the world? Okay. Well, thanks, Nick. Um, first, <clears throat> let me just explain our land. We've been here 73 years. So the lens with which we look at uh, a country is very long. You know, we aspire to be here forever and grow with this country and, and help the um, communities uh, in the countries we serve. Mm -hmm. The other part of that lens we look at is that we're really very encouraged by what has happened in seven months. Uh, I think there has been a significant will to make the right decisions, but let's also recognize that the task that's ahead of us is both daunting, it's not easy, but at the same time, the opportunity is, has what I call a multiplier effect. When Egypt works economically, it's not only gonna be good for the 90 million people of Egypt, but it's also going to be good for Africa, it's going to be good for the rest of the Middle East and the region and the world. We live in this kind of an interconnected world. So the question is, are we determined to capture this opportunity? And do the government of Egypt realize, which they do, that what's at stake is, is an incredibly high opportunity? So I think if we look at it at a very long-term perspective uh, and bank on the encouragement that, that we have already have with the great action, so we just have to be more optimistic about the future. But what must we do? That's the key question. If I have to leave a couple of messages here, um, there's going to be mistake made along the way. Things will happen slowly. Um, there will be wrong decisions. There'll be all kinds of things. And there is really one antidote to keep us on this track to realizing this opportunity. And that's dialogue of the government with the private sector. So if, <laughs> so if tomorrow we're faced with some sort of a tax law that's discriminatory or that just doesn't make any economic sense, that's gonna be one of the bad decisions. But if this process is run in a collaborative way, let's have a goal to have dialogue between private sector and government like no time before. Think of it like the reforms that you've already done and let's make that change. I think that's going to minimize uh, the mishaps along the way and that's going to make us go faster. Now the quid pro quo for that, I would say for my company, and I would advocate for the business world, and Joe had very eloquently mentioned that in the speech before, is that we have to be here with the intention to lay roots and to be part of the local fabric and to be part of the local society and operate our business, not just for profitability, but also for a lot of social good. And I think if we do all of that, if we all want to make this happen, we will make this happen with uh, very good dialogue. So I would just like to leave it with that wish. Joe, do you want to add anything, and Lubna as well, because in the end, and I'll be talking to Tony Blair about this, there are many parts of Africa in the emerging world, okay, there's been a major disruption here four years ago, which are looking at, who are looking at Europe, who are looking at Egypt and saying, what can we follow, what can we learn from this experience in Egypt? What, what, what are you taking away from this process, which is moving very fast, but with a lot of public aspirations and expectations? Lubna, first of all. Well, I think what we have seen is quite very, very impressive. And what we learn from it is uh, to see Egypt, which is important for the whole Arab world, getting its act together, getting the economy stronger, which is essential for all the population of Egypt and for the rest of the Arab world is, is, is a great aspiration for all of us. Uh, what I hope as an Arab is to see Arab countries follow suit. Iraq has been disappointing for us. Libya is another disappointment and all this. So I hope 
Egypt, as usual, lead the Arab world in the, its economic and structural and all the reforms that it does, and that's a great aspiration for all of us. Mm. Uh, Joe, Joe, and I, Joe and I think globally as well, or regionally, uh, uh, the way Egypt is being looked at as the model. Well, first of all, I wish we had as many opportunity in Europe as we have in Egypt. <laughs> Secondly, and I was very impressed about the debate about is one day short or is seven months long. Um, this is about change. It is like you change a company. I have a company which has 360,240 people. This is, Egypt is a company of 90 million people. So how do you manage this change? There's got to be leadership. There's got to be a very clear direction where we are going. And I have to say I'm impressed about the leadership which we see in this country. <laughs> and then secondly, if I may, secondly, if I may, you know, it is not always about speed and bureaucracy. It's, it is also about being specific. What exactly is it that I want to do and when do I want to achieve it so that people know this is where we are going and this is exactly what we want to do. So be specific. Don't change everything at the same time. That confuses the society. Say first, we do energy first. Then we do infrastructure. Then we build wind farms and then we save the gas for fertilizers. And once we do the fertilizer, we get more food. So make an agenda which depends one after another and people will understand and they will support it. Right. We've got about 15 minutes to go, and what I want to do is put some of these issues being raised here to me uh, on the agenda, and all of you jump in if you want to contribute, particularly this one from Gamal Goumet. What measures are being taken to ensure the transparency of procedures and offering investors a comprehensive roadmap from setup to start of operations in dealing with different government entities? Whether you're in government or out of government, I mean, where are the problems? What are the solutions, Minister? Who, who'd like to jump in? No, I mean, we wholeheartedly support the question, and this is certainly one of the very important um, road uh, milestones for the investment environment to continue to get better. And uh, I'm sure the minister will, will address it, but uh, we are observing that with great interest and great willingness to help in the process. Transparency, Nagib. How much transparency must there be to ensure procedures and offering investors a comprehensive roadmap? I'm not worried only about transparency. I mean, it's more important to have uh, uh, these steps already uh, aligned, uh, aligned and clear. So I don't think uh, it's been done in all the sectors. Uh, what we need is a clarity on the roadmap. Let's say I'm an investor who wants to build a power station on solar. And so I need to know that the steps are one, two, three, four, seven, and they're all done. You know. The problem in Egypt is not the minister or the people. I mean, the problem is that once you go down to the municipality, for example, for a building permit, then it's welcome to nightmare. You know, it's like a nightmare, you know. So uh, that's the problem. So how are you going to solve this? Look, could I just hear from the investor, a couple of other investors, from Karim and Mahazim, how much is there a concern about too much transparency in this country, given the way investment has been done up to now? Yeah, I think there is indeed a concern uh, but I think it's it's being tackled uh, and uh, I'm more concerned about you know um, actually executing uh, the uh, the process the investment process when because now with the new investment law the way I look at it is the Ministry of Investments is going to step in the shoes of the investor so executing this is, is, more, is, is more important to me. And I think by doing so, you need an outside body, uh, a senior one that has, you know, direct report to uh, all the way up to the, uh, 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 all the way up to make sure that, you know, the, Minister of, the Ministry of Investments are executing the process, uh, the one-stop shop process. And, you know, adding to that, they can also uh, ensure uh, uh, transparency of the processes. So maybe a body, a senior body that is being looked, an independent one, that not to ensure that the, 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 the well-doing of the, the, the ministry or the different government bodies, but to actually facilitate their work 
once they get uh, faced with bureaucracy. Alan Bajani, do you have any concerns about greater transparency and accountability? On the contrary, I think the more the merrier. I mean, it should be, it should be perfectly transparent. I think we've suffered a lot in the good sense and in the bad sense because of the lack of transparency. An example that Nagib Sawir has brought forward is the fact that because of the lack of transparency, some people have been <coughs> punished for good decisions made, but no one understood it. No one understood Minister, why and how. Minister, the view from inside about how transparent, and this came out in many of the interventions yesterday from the political leaders on, on, on this platform. There's got to be transparency, there's got to be accountability. Let me, let me first confirm what they, were, what they are saying concerning the procedures of acquiring permits and licenses. <coughs> we do have more than 100 government bodies used to provide license and permits. And also, we do have more than 399 procedures in order to, go, to get your company operated. So, yes, we do have that. But you imagine a lot of municipalities, a lot of governorates involved in this process. So we have two fights here. Fight number one is to pass it in the law, to pass it in the law in order to have the law empowering a body as a one-stop shop, to be empowered by law. And then the second fight is to go into process re-engineering, and which will be done definitely through a full automated process. It will never be done manually. So this is our second fight. I think successfully, for the first time in Egypt's life, we have passed the first battle by passing this in the law, which was issued uh, the day before yesterday. So this is one thing. Now, we have one ministry that can uh, uh, be empowered by law in order to issue permits and licenses. And we will move to our second fight, which is implementation, which we do understand it is quite difficult, and we do understand also it is quite challenging, but we will continue taking the challenge because we are committed to remove red tape, and we are committed to facilitate investments, and we are committed to bring back growth. So we don't have except one way is to do it. The address is still up there. If you want to uh, give me any, any further thoughts for this or Tony Blair shortly, ask at egyptthefuture.com. But let me, Nagib, just before you come in, there's a point here from Ahmed Hussein. The company's law has the same set of provisions, requirements, and rules for the AGM, the EGM, the Articles of Association for large public companies. Um, this is a burden on SMEs in the formal sector and an invitation to move back to the informal sector. Is the government going to consider a separate set of provisions for small joint stock companies and limited liability companies? Do you recognize the problem, Nagib? I, I recognize the problem. I think uh, he's absolutely right. We cannot deal with big corporates who are listed on a stock exchange with small uh, companies or SMEs. Otherwise, we will bury them to life. They cannot afford the legal cost. They cannot afford the inception of the company. And therefore, we need to uh, change the laws to boost small businesses and middle size because the small businesses provide more jobs than large businesses. But I just want to add something to, because I don't want uh, the viewers here to think uh, pessimistic that we're complaining and so. The fact is, many companies like ours, like uh, uh, the Oriental Weavers, like Culipatra Ceramica, like Orascom companies, like, uh, so they worked under these bureaucratic and difficult situation and in the end, they made tons of money. So it means you can make a lot of money in Egypt here, even though we have these bureaucracies. You know. If, of course, they abolish the bureaucracies, then we will all fly. You know. Abolish the bureaucracies, but this issue of SMEs, Minister, and regulation. Uh, I think if we wait for the coming two weeks, we will be finding a lot of amendments also in the corporate law that removes all the obstacles and high cost process from SMEs. But let me, when we talk about SME, say that we have much more higher responsibility and in-depth responsibility than only removing some governance that has to do with blue chips compared to SMEs. Now, we do have uh, uh, other challenges which has to do with real governance, which has to do with financial statements, which has to do with uh, documentation and 
endorsement of the financial figures. And in Egypt, this is our largest problem with SMEs. The matter is not banking availability for financing. The matter is readiness to finance. So we have to work on that very hard. And I think we have Bidaya Center, which was established in order to create uh, help for small and medium enterprises in, in the area of readiness in financial statements, readiness in, in acceptable requested governance uh, that comply with the size of SMEs, and also that has to do with uh, uh, making, helping in business plan in order to acquire banking finance or in order to acquire private equity SME finance. Lubna or Ahmed, do you see this as a, as a major challenge, not just here but elsewhere? Lubna, on SMEs. On, on the SMEs, yes, I think as uh, Najib has said, SMEs are very important to, uh, for employment and the encouragement of SMEs is very important, especially I think for a society that wants to build its middle class. And I think the Arab world, one of our biggest problem is our middle classes are really shrinking and our job is really to create middle class, which is always a backbone to society. But if you would allow me, I think one of the issues that is important to handle is I've have, I have heard from many foreign companies who are investing in Egypt is the difficulty of getting money out of the country. And, uh, and I haven't heard really, I know th the cash crunch that is happening, but I sit on the board of a multinational company and one of our issues is really how do we get dollars out of the country? And I think that is something that would really encourage more investors coming into the country if they see the ease of bringing money in and out of the country being facilitated. I see the minister nodding there. And you have agreement here. Uh, we only have three or four minutes. Let me just pick up on another point. You've stimulated a lot of debate about bureaucracy and about ministries. Let me offer you this point from Mohammed Azab. We have almost seven million public servants, and we actually need one if compared to OECD levels. That is a reasonable plan to restructure the administration. Is this the kind of target, Minister, you need to have in your ministry, the, a dramatic reduction of civil servants, public servants? He's nodding. Yes. That's agreement. Yes. Is that the kind of number you see, Nagib? Uh, I'm not sure if from seven to one, but let's go for seven to three, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, let me pick up on the pharmaceutical business from Abdelaziz Saad. What are the parameters or new regulations that will be set from the government for investors in the healthcare sector? Can you help on that one? Can you repeat it? Uh, the new parameters, new regulations for investment in the healthcare sector. Is that likely? Health sector? Health sector. Health sector. Health sector. Uh, let me tell you that we need the full restructure in the health sector, and I think this is being under preparation by Minister of Health now and his team, and very soon he will be presenting a full strategy of liberalization and deregulation of health sector after we introduce the de deregulation and liberalization of uh, electricity sector. So it is matter of priorities. We started with electricity sector in form of deregulation because it is important, very important component on top of our priorities in order to attract, not only actually to fill the gap in electricity flow nowadays, but also in order to attract more investments so as to uh, achieve our plan. So I think health sector is coming in row and also education sector is coming in low when liberalization is concerned. We're very much committed as existing government and as a country for, to liberalize our sectors as we are very much committed also to a liberal economy. So we are uh, taking step by step in, in following liberalization of sectors. Thank you, right. Let me just give you one final question about what the planning and reform minister said earlier. Investment rate is now 14%. It should be 30% by 2030. Unemployment rate now 13% down to 5%. Do you see this as achievable? Let me just go along all of you quickly. Yes, through a greater involvement of the private sector and a greater development of the small and medium enterprises, yes, it is achievable by 2030. I concur. Well, the 100 
at 44,000 jobs that we're announcing are a good answer to that. Certainly, having seen the level of support from around the region here and the turnout uh, in a conference like this, we're certainly very optimistic that those are achievable. Even if it is not achievable to the exact no number, just working towards it and getting close to it is, is very good. I say I'm, I'm extremely optimistic. I'm sure this conference here is going to be uh, remembered in history as the point of start, you know, as our starting point. So I'm very optimistic. You know. I mean, it was a great start today, so I'm fully in for the next 150 years. But Joe, the reason I look at you is you deal in so many other countries and you see aspirations from governments. When you see these kind of figures, you say to yourself, it's the optimistic side of calculation. Well, you have to have, you know, it's a saying, and it says you have to have a dream first before it becomes reality. So let's start this one and get it done. There's 90 million people, there is great infrastructure, it can be done, but we need to have a clear agenda and do one thing at a time going forward. Energy agenda, infrastructure, industrialization, local job creation, and then we have healthcare, and this is a great country. Uh, Minister, great finally, of course, you will say this is all achievable. But no, what, what? I would say very conservative, and we will outperform. What will you have achieved in the next seven months, Minister? <laughs> nice one, man. You're what among. What will you you're among friends here, so. Uh, actually, we will achieve in the coming three months. We will be seeing down the road more than 4% growth in GDP by end of fiscal year 14-15. We will be seeing also a special unit for investment till we have that, that will facilitate the license permits and procedures in a specific time, till we have an institutional framework. We commit ourselves for our investors to do that. And we will be achieving also, we'll be seeing more FDIs coming to the country. I think we'll be seeing in a neighborhood of eight to $10 billion before end of fiscal year 1415. Uh, I think all should be on board of the train. Can I thank you, Minister, and uh, the seven investors? We got through an enormous amount in about 40 minutes, so I appreciate uh, your contributions. May I invite you to leave the stage and uh, we'll just do a quick switch. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.